Hey, Troop Loaders, I am Michael Stevens from the YouTube channel Vsauce. What was your background prior to uh, being a kick ass mortar? Hello, it's Tuesday, it's four o'clock, so we're live and we're talking about biohacking. Now, biohacking is breaking down life itself into smaller components without the help of Big Pharma and all the money and all the infrastructure that goes with it. And joining us today to talk about this very thing, we have Funk and Raphael from London Biohack Space. So, hello, guys. I should hello. say, just before we get started, if you have any comments, guys, whilst you're watching or any questions you'd like to put to, to our two guests, do get in touch. Uh, and leave them in a the comment, we'll be able to read them out. So, hi, Funk and Raphael from London by Hackspace. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Um, so, guys, maybe just for any, anyone at home who's probably never heard of biohacking, maybe you could explain what London Biohackspace is and how, for example, you would get involved. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Funk from the Biohackspace. And I co-founded the Biohack Space in 2011. We're based in London, just by overground uh, station Hoxton. And we are within the London Hack Space, and we are basically a community lab for molecular biology. Um, what we do is genetic testing and hopefully synthetic biology as well in the future. Um, we are open to everyone, uh, mainly non-professionals, and who are interested in biology and citizen science in general. And uh, it's absolutely free. Um, we are self-founded through donations. And if you are interested, you can come along every Wednesday night um, at 7. Awesome. Thanks, Funk. So just before we get straight into the conversation, I'd like to tell you guys what's coming up as well. We're also going to hear some uh, comments from Lucas de Maveo, who we did a piece about on Friday. He's from Grindhouse Wetwares in the United States. They literally hack the body to do new and interesting, cool things in a weird cyborg, but very ethical way. That's going to be really interesting as well. So, guys, maybe you could explain what project you're working on as a biohacker right now. Okay. Um, well, I guess um, what we're doing at the moment is we are trying to do uh, DNA barcoding, which is basically um, profiling the DNA of... Um, entities such as, you know, um, for instance, meat. And um, an interesting project that we have uh, completed recently is the um, um, uh, iGEM competition, which we did in collaboration with UCL. And iGEM is basically a competition for synthetic uh, biology, which is hosted by the MIT in Boston. And together with UCL, we created the first bi public biobrick to uh, degrade uh, mercury as um, a toxic water pollutant and also to create antifreeze bacteria which could survive the colds in, uh, in, in the seas and degrade uh, pollution there. And so I guess this was the biggest thing we've been working on and at the moment we are trying to obtain a CAT1 license to do synthetic biology in the future. So, Raphael, what do you think the difference is between just science, straight up biology science, and biohacking? Well, I guess you need to talk about um, the context that your work sits in, really. Um, I mean, many of us um, think that scientists kind of belong in a lab with a professional environment, uh, maybe a part of a pharmaceutical company whose interest is maybe not so much to do with people's health care, but laden with political and uh, social issues as well. So I think biohacking kind of brings the audience uh, together and kind of making people realize that science isn't just about many lab coats. It's something that you can actually do. Um, I'm kind of coming from design po uh, point of view where you can start to design devices and small protocols that you can do at home to do stuff that you may never 
thought of doing, for example, collecting genetic data from your environment and so on. So how easy is this stuff to do? It sounds uh, incredibly complicated, but and often when we think of these things, or biology, or synthetic biology, in my mind it conjures images of something that's incredibly difficult to do, something that only big uh, companies with a huge budget can do, but it seems that this isn't quite the case. So how easy is it to get involved in this kind of stuff? Um, it actually is very easy. I mean, speaking for myself, I'm no biologist at all. I'm not trained in biology. I'm actually a product designer. And I started this movement, this collective, together with other people um, two years ago because I got fascinated by the possibility of doing biology at home. And I also was um, thinking at the time that it was something impossible for me to do. And instead, it's not. If you come along to a lab, you can easily be proven wrong if you think that this is too hard to do. We have been building all our tools uh, by ourselves. Um, um, we bought some old ones on eBay as well. And uh, we uh, were able to extract DNA from our own bodies to uh, replicate it, to test it, um, to amplify it, which means you know, making multiple copies of it. And then we can basically, you know, um, do what a professional lab does, but with uh, much less money. In fact, with very pretty much zero money, and um, and we've the expertise of people coming from different backgrounds. I'm a designer. Raphael also is a designer. We had some uh, computer scientists. Um, we have some um, people who are expert in um, electronics and stuff like that. Um, so it's all about being together, bringing people together and try to work um, each of us, bringing a different perspective to it. Absolutely. And also you've got to think about the economic background as well because all these pharma companies who started up a few years ago are going down, going out of business. And because of that, things are more accessible. You know, equipment to do molecular biology are accessible. I think Funk mentioned there earlier about eBay, how you can actually source different equipment uh, that you can use in your hack space. So this realization that perhaps this kind of science, this extremely uh, interesting and cutting edge science perhaps, is actually accessible to your ordinary citizen. Do you think that realization might possibly change the way we live or change some aspects of our lives? Ultimately, what is the, the, the potential of this kind of science? Well, um, I think it can change the way we look at things. I'm not sure, you know, how it, how radically it can change our own lives, and you know whether this is happening right now or it will happen in the future. But I would, I would compare the uh, biohacking movement to the hacking movement that uh, happened with computers, personal computing, back in the 70s. And I mean, I guess that you know, personal computing changed the world. Um, computers used to be uh, in the hands of big companies um, with you know um, lots of money, and then all of a sudden they went into the hands of people, and that changed you know the whole the whole way we use and um, we use computers. And I guess that's pretty much what's, what's happening with biology. Um, yeah. And also, Do you think it's, uh, sorry, uh, Raphael. Sorry. Go ahead. It, I, I guess it depends. Depends what you mean by by hacking. I think I guess you can actually interpret it in different levels. I mean, people have been messing around with, say, microorganisms for centuries. Uh, you know, fermentation technology that's already been done at home. Um, and also, there's a whole issue of MRSA in hospitals. Um, so if you think about how we interact with microbes today, it, it hasn't really changed much, but. It's really kind of bringing out the awareness of what we can do with these microbes and how we can actually do them. So what about the, the ethical side of this? You, um, is it ethical to gather people's DNA, pe perhaps, so using these devices which you mentioned, and then be able to replicate it? Well, I guess it is. And uh, the whole point is that this has been done for quite a while now by uh, pharmaceutical companies who can actually pattern DNA sequences and store them into uh, genomic databases. So this is a bit like patenting people's identities in a way, or bits and bobs of their identities. Um, so this has been going on for a while now, and it's at the moment with biohacking, 
the whole point is that this is not just in the hands of big companies anymore. It's in the hands of uh, the general public. So um, if it's ethic, you know, ethical to um, to have it done by uh, big companies, it also is to have it done by people. And I must say, um, all the biohackers I've met so far. Um, uh, are no dangerous people, you know, it, it's all for uh, science sake and discovery sake, it's not really for any bioterrorism reasons. So yeah, I would say there's there's no risk to it, or it's a very, very limited risk. Now there's some companies uh, that, that we've spoken to, we did a piece about this on Friday about a company called Grindhouse Wetwares, we spoke to a guy called uh, Lucas DeMavo, and he actually has a company that is involved in hacking or if you can call it that, putting implants inside of people to measure their health. And when we spoke to him, he spoke about his aspirations about what he'd like these health implants to do. And this is what he said. So let's just take a look. Right now we're working on uh, a quantified self um, device that essentially takes a temperature and heart rate, I'm sorry, uh, and it, it kicks it up to your phone um, so you could you know, check uh, how your heart's doing at any particular moment. The eventual hope is to get a, a number of sensors that measure a number of things so that you can measure your health over time instead of uh, taking snapshots of your health uh, by going to a doctor. We also hope to get this as inexpensive as possible so that we can get it to everyone. Uh, we, one of the big concerns in transhumanism is that when these technologies come out, they'll go straight to people with lots and lots of money and leave everyone else behind. We kind of want to preemptively spread the technology. So we asked Lucas, uh, because we were really interested, so it, within this movement, what does he really hope to get out of it? What does he hope it can achieve? And this is what he has to say. My dream is for people to realize their dreams. I'd, I'd like to see a uh, you know, store on, on some street corner in London or New York or Pittsburgh or LA where someone can go they can uh, pick out a module that they want implanted in themselves, uh, or maybe a kit, they can buy it. And they can go home and experiment with it and uh, modify themselves in the way that they see themselves. You know, everyone kind of has a dream as to this cool ability that they've always wanted to have since they were a kid, or um, something cool that they read in a comic book, you know, oh wow, it'd be cool to have like x-ray vision or something. I'd like someone to go to to location and realize their dreams. So Raphael, what do you think about the uh, idea, I guess, because it's, it's within biohacking in general, of being able to hack the human body to achieve yes. things we couldn't ordinarily achieve? I think um, biohacking is a really personal venture, I guess, uh, although it's a, it's a movement that involves many different people. I think at the end of the day, the biohacking kind of brings it to your own personal lives and how you could actually use these technology on a more of a personal level uh, rather than uh, you know through healthcare or medication as such. Um, I mean some of the projects I've been involved with are dealing with hacking into small animals that you find in the garden and these guys are really good at extracting DNA from uh, an environment and it kind of speculates on the future where we can start to use these animals to hunt different genetic uh, materials from your environment and you can actually extract, extract those and think about other possibilities you know what type of cheese could he actually harvest from the environment and what kind of uses you might have you know, it might not necessarily be for medication or healthcare or even fermentation it could be something more personal so it's, sorry guys I think someone somewhere is scratching on a microphone I can hear but I'm interested in this idea of hacking uh, animals the animals that you hack, Raphael, are they, are they alive when you do this? What kind of animals are we talking about? Uh, the organism that I was interested in was called rotifers, and these are small multicellular animals that are uh, commonly found in the garden or the back backyard. Um, and these guys have extraordinary ability to um, do what we call the horizontal genetic transfer, which is to ingest um, foreign DNA materials that's outside of their body and incorporating them into their own genome. So biohacking isn't necessarily about genetic modification that you actually do. It's something that you can actually modify using natural materials and also using other animals to do the job for you. 
I've got um, a question here from Ben Goldman on YouTube. So either one of you, please do feel free to take up the reins on this one. Let's say that this does go mainstream. Are you not worried that the price to get this done will dramatically go up? for a better standard of the implants? I guess he's referring to the kind of work that uh, Lucas is doing. Um, well, no, I mean, it's not really a point of going mainstream and the price is going up, really, because um, the mentality is still the same. It's the hacking mentality, and we, we still do things ourselves, and we still build our own tools um, with the expertise of people coming from different backgrounds. Um, so in fact, I think the more it goes mainstream, the cheaper it is going to get because more people will uh, will join in and, and collaborate to find low cost solutions. So would you try it, Funk? Would you hack your own body uh, on a project that you you dreamt up? Well, um, I think we're doing something different and uh, from what these Lucas is doing uh, at the biohack space because we're not really hacking bodies or animals or things. Uh, we're working on DNA mainly. So what we do, if you ask me about hacking my own body, well, I've extracted my DNA and I tested it to see, you know, whether I had some genes, say, you know, the gene for red hair, which I, you know, clearly don't have, or it's not expressed at least. And so, uh, you know, it's not really about hacking your body in a way that, for instance, Stellark, the artist, would do using the technologies and, you know, new media and things. It's more about um, extracting DNA out of your body and, and play with it in a way. Um, so, Raphael, maybe I can ask you uh, one final question. What do you think, since the technology for this kind of experimentation is coming down in cost, what do you think the future holds for people who want to get involved in this kind of stuff? And what kind of things do you think we might be able to discover using this kind of uh, method of scientific endeavor? Well, uh, I think um, people will be more free to experiment with uh, personal projects um, and also not really restricted by rules of academia or even uh, companies and corporations. Um, I think we'll see many different ideas coming up, uh, especially in the domestic space, um, since that people are more have more access to, um, you know, living animals like rotifers in a domestic space as well. Awesome guys, it's been really interesting talk. Uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by all of this this entire topic. The the idea that you can kind of test your own DNA without a huge amount of equipment or money I think is a fascinating idea and I'd love to perhaps even come down and see what you guys do so if anybody who's watching is interested we'll put the link up to uh, the biohack space in the description if that's okay with you guys absolutely that's actually fine. please do our website we is we biohackspace.org so that so there you go. So uh, if you do want to get involved in biohacking of any description, you should probably go and speak to these guys down there first. Make sure you know what you're actually doing. Um, so th thanks very much, guys, for joining us. I should say to anybody watching tomorrow, we have our Soapbox feature that's live at 4 p.m. with Mary McCarthy. That's going to be awesome. And on Thursday, on the back of uh, something that myself and Adam went and filmed on Monday, we are having a debate about why are we not so interested in politics anymore. Voter turnout is pretty low. Young people are not hugely engaged in politics as they once were. Why is that the case? We're having a debate about this live on Thursday at 7 p.m. It's going to be great, so make sure you stick around and tune in for that. Other than that, we shall see you again tomorrow live at 4 p.m. Thanks so much for the conversation, guys. Thank you. Thank you.